like to introduce to you today Gary Holden. And, yeah, thanks for being on my show. Thank you for being a part of us. And um, it's an honor to have you here and just have you be a part of my life as well. Thanks. And, um, but if you would like to sh elaborate a little bit more and tell us a little bit of your background and uh, who you work with and that type of thing. Sure. So. Well, the, the um, um, National Recovery Month and, and the local stuff uh, interested me. Um, because there are so few avenues for people in recovery to get heard and get seen, there's uh, in the treatment field, there's issues of confidentiality and in the self-support groups, there's this anonymity piece. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, A&E and, and SAMHSA and trying to get the word out about people in recovery and trying to make it an attractive thing sure. is a good thing. And I, I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, in my own recovery, I like to be a, a, of service and of use, and, and it was a way I could be of use. And How many people um, that were there uh, that had a lot of recovery time, and a lot of times people you don't hear about, neighbors, right. coworkers, and leaders in your community. And so, like you said, um, a lot of times the um, people don't hear about it because maybe the shame and the stigma that's involved. And, and so that's what we try to do is uh, with the celebration um, and other things we do throughout the year, this show is trying to put um, a face to recovery and showing mm -hmm. that it's possible. I think what we want to start out with uh, is help break down the dynamics of addiction and, and how uh, people end up getting into uh, using in their life and, and how that whole process just evolves and before you know uh, before you know it you're in it and so I guess the first thing to say is you know even though uh, sometimes we say we know this but I think a lot of times the community um, forgets or, or really maybe are not really um, aware is that people never set out to start using um, to become addicted, to become dependent on any substances in their life and have it take them down the path that it does. I mean, who in the right mind, right mind, would ever, you know, um, would want to do that to right. themselves? So maybe could we start with that and break down how um, a person uh, ends up starting off on that path and then how it breaks down from there. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the words or the, the thing that gets looked at as addiction, when does somebody cross the line is loss of control. When do you lose control? Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, nobody wants to lose control. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're going to talk about the families, it's a good time to say that's probably the same line that the family crosses when they no longer have control. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we all as human beings desire control and where does our control start and where does it end? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to determine. Recovery is ultimately a person's responsibility um, for their recovery. Uh, but there's other factors that come into play um, that people forget about too. And so, for example, um, in my opinion anyway, that why people start using, whether they develop a problem or not, is typically because of peer pressure. Mm -hmm. And in Wisconsin, as they say and as they come to see in the research, um, is that we're on the map um, mm -hmm. for the drinking culture. And it's not a matter of uh, why are you drinking, it's why aren't you drinking, you know? So people start out with that and, and uh, starts out maybe just on the weekends, you know, and just go out for a good time on the weekends. And then before you know it, it becomes, you know, weekly, you know, other days throughout the week. And then it turns into, well, you know, you're just all of a sudden only hanging out with people who use just like you. And then the things you enjoyed uh, doing before, whether it be fishing or or other kind of sports or, or whatever you um, enjoy doing otherwise, uh, now all of a sudden you're using takes place with that. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it again, if you can't use while doing those things, then you just don't do those things anymore. Mm -hmm. And it just keeps evolving like that. And then before you know it, here you are, 
you're in this web that you've woven for yourself mm -hmm. and you're like how did I get to this place and many people and I'm sure you've experienced this um, my husband and I used to you know run a rec used to run a recovery facility and people came in and they already know you know they're already questioning themselves how did I get here they're already feeling the the whole shame and the whole stigma and the whole self-condemnation. Mm -hmm. You've experienced that with many right. people you work with too? Well, it's a good description of the progression and the, uh, you know, and trying to diagnose what is addiction and, and separating the difference between use and abuse and addiction I think is important. Mm -hmm. But it, it starts out with use. It, it sure. has to start with use. The first symptom is using. Right. And, uh, um, it's not the only symptom, and oftentimes that's what we focus on. That's the start. Mm -hmm. and, and where does it turn into becoming uh, the most or more important in someone's life where they, where, where they stop their, their other activities or their family mm -hmm. or, or care for their employment or, or their children or whatever it is where mm -hmm. the chemical becomes their life. And uh, sure. um, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a, it's a long progression. Long progression. And, uh, and yeah. there's uh, various phases of that progression. Mm -hmm. um, but I like uh, the idea of separating use and abuse. And it's, it's very easy to meet criteria for abuse. And, and certainly uh, Wisconsin supports abuse of sure. alcohol and binge drinking and, mm -hmm. and heavy drinking. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's the start when, when um, there's a dependence on, on using to modify emotions. We start getting in trouble with it. Mm. I depend on it to, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, variate my emotions to some degree. Mm -hmm. Now, all drinkers do that. All users do that. That's probably why they start using this mm. to modify. Let's have fun. Sure. I want to get high. I want to mm -hmm. feel less than low, apparently. So right. it, it's, it's a normal start. Yeah. Uh, for everyone. For everyone. I right. Think, I think that's yes. true. We don't mm -hmm. use to have a bad time. It's, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's to get higher. It's yeah. to get feeling better. Unless um, you maybe, if you're drinking a, a glass of wine with a meal, that might, sure. be, might be different. When it becomes so. routine that uh, sure. emotions depend on the chemical and, and, mm -hmm. and very changing emotions depend on the chemical. Sure. As, as, and, and a part of the problem, uh, you know, the, the, the user and the family um, don't uh, want to admit that's happening because, again, we don't want to feel out of control. We want to be in control. I, th I don't think it's the only disease that we minimize, though. I think when we're sick, we minimize how sick we really are. When mm -hmm. my dad had heart attacks, he's, sure. he said, I'm fine. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't That's know that he, he was a liar. He just we minimize what's wrong with us, and right. so it's a normal part of the progression. And it, yeah. people say, "Well, they got to hit rock bottom." Well, that is, a, you know, we we admit that we hurt when we hurt. And, sure. Uh, it's easier to admit it when it's really painful. I think people lapse and relapse in in any illnesses because of humanness and yeah. and because we we feel better. Mm -hmm. If I have a cold and the doctor says, get plenty of rest, drink plenty of fluids, and don't work for a while, and I feel better, mm -hmm. I go to work and I don't get plenty of rest and I quit sure. drinking as much. And, and it's just a human, uh, a human trait to sort of back off what I should be doing. I know I should, sure. but I don't. And, and so relapse starts with stopping the recommendations, mm -hmm. just slowing down the recommendations generally. You know, the... Usually, um, in the later stage of addictions, when people go back to use, it's not a pleasant uh, experience. They're not doing it to have fun anymore. They're not doing it to get at anybody. They're not doing it um, other than um, the drug is more important than mm -hmm. breath itself. Sure. And, and that dependence has become so strong that that appears to be the truth. Well, you mentioned a little bit about yourself, so me. Being that you did, so may we ask how many years um, of recovery time you have in your mm -hmm. life then? Very grateful to say that I've been clean and sober since December 19, 1987. So I okay. just celebrated 24 years of recovery. Wow, that's great. It is great. Yeah. Uh, what does recovery blessing. mean to you? 
What, what has it done for you, and what does it mean to have recovery? What does, how would you hmm. show that to people? The early need to cope with life by using, uh, to deal with people, to deal with stress, mm -hmm. um, to deal with life uh, only by using, and to be free of that need is, is so <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. Sure. It's such a blessing, and and, um, and and I've had some fun with it. We were talking the other day about dancing sober and mm. and uh, went out with my family a couple of years ago, and we were listening to some music, and in the loud music, my sister-in-law come running up, and she said, you look so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and I, there wouldn't have been a day that I could look stupid on the dance floor sure. without using something. Ah, and right. It really feels good. Yeah. It's a Look stupid. <laughs> just be stupid and look stupid. Yeah, really. It. it took me some time. Um, um, I sobered up and I, I, I trembled for about a year, and there was no physical reason for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that uh, most of it was uh, just anxiety. Mm -hmm. And after after a length of use, uh, using chemicals for 15, 20 years. Uh, um, it just takes time for the body and the, and the central nervous system to yeah. adapt. And, sure. Um, one author says uh, recovery is stressful. Mm. And uh, it's very stressful. And uh, you know, welcome to recovery. Now you got to now deal with stress of recovery. Can you break that down a little bit more? Hmm. The stress of recovery? Well, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, you know, oftentimes people uh, get in the legal system, they get in trouble, they get introduced to um, sort of forced recovery. Mm -hmm. And now they, they might be mandated to do some treatment, inpatient or outpatient, but then they get out and they're back to reality, back into the home, back into the job, back into the family, back into the responsibilities, some of which they didn't have to begin with. Mm -hmm. I can tell you in my own using, that was a great, it was really a defense system Mm -hmm. to explain why, you know, I'm out of control. I knew I was out of control. And if somebody said, it looks like you just don't care. If you'd care, you'd be on your job and you'd be responsible. And mm -hmm. and, and so to explain, you know, it, I, I just went along with that. You're right, I don't care. Sure. And uh, and, and hurt some people in, in that statement. Um, you know, somebody could say, well, you know, you don't care. It's a matter of attitude. and. But there's got to be something that brought you to that place of feeling like, feeling that way, or uh, no hope, or, you know, what was that? Yeah, you know, the, the technology today, um, you know, the, what we can look at in the chemistry of the brain, and it makes some sense scientifically that um, the flight or fight system um, doesn't work real well uh, into later stage addiction. Um, it's, it's more that of uh, maybe a, a, a post-traumatic stress disorder, that of a, a, a vet, a war veteran, that really got taught to, to set aside emotions because mm -hmm. we got a, a war to fight here. Sure. And if you're emotional, you're not gonna survive, and it's mm -hmm. the truth. Mm -hmm. And so they learn that behavior and then when they come back, they have to undo that. Mm -hmm. And it's real similar, I think, with the... The person the, with the addiction. With yeah. the addiction, that that mm -hmm. flight or fight system doesn't work. So using feels like survival. Right. Not using feels like death. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And see, that's the thing that for people to understand out there. And, hey, mm -hmm. I'm all for supporting our veterans, too. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, I'm a proud daughter of a Vietnam veteran. For those who know, you know, mm -hmm. I've done for over 10 years now, a lot of advocacy work and awareness on behalf of uh, Vietnam veterans and the whole Vietnam era, actually. But uh, so I, I'm all in support of that and, and the veterans returning today. And of course, people are gonna step up and support our vets. Well, that's great because there was a time where that didn't happen as much as right. it is today. But at the same time, I'm so glad you said that because veterans aren't the only ones who have post-traumatic stress or have come through trauma or real pain or have um, created these defenses uh, in order to deal or not deal with some of that trauma and pain. One of the things, uh, one of the studies show when they study lab rats and cocaine or heroin, uh, some of the more addictive, fast-acting substances and, and 
uh, this rat instinctually, if you walk into a room, turn on the light, this rat will hide. Well, if you feed it these drugs, eventually it just doesn't care. The light's on and you're mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. it, will, it will sit there and ingest the drug. Sure. And it's the same survival instinct of humans. We mm -hmm. will not care. Mm -hmm. I don't care mm -hmm. anymore. It, sure. looks, it looks that way. Right. Um, but it really is a flight or fight system mm -hmm. gone haywire. Counselor on another show that we did, and he uh, honestly he admitted that uh, whenever he had dealt with a lot of his clients with addictions, uh, he automatically and naturally um, has the assumption, oh, surely they must have came from a family with addictions. Mm -hmm. But he said, yeah, you're right. Uh, that's not always the case, and a lot of times it's not the case at all. Even though the parents didn't have a, any addictions themselves. Uh, some of the things that um, you know that took that did or did not take place in that home are the family dynamics, and that could be different for 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 everyone. But it could be well, we don't communicate, we don't talk about things. If something's going on, we pretend it's not happening. Whether it's relating to that person with the addiction or anything that was going on in the family, mm. you know, or even in general, um, a, lot, a lot of times people don't. They don't want conflict. They don't want uh, to. They don't want to fight. Well, who wants to fight? Who who wants to have conflict in the end? But how do you ever learn or get conflict resolution unless it's in the middle of the conflict? You can never avoid conflict. But some people will go way out of their way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a bad thing. It's a teaching moment. Mm -hmm. It's a time to find resolve. You know, and typically otherwise, what have you, or even people without addictions do. They walk away with resentments, they just cut off relationships, um, they go to everybody else instead directly to the person, or they're hurt, and, but oh, I'm okay, when they're really not, and then it comes out later through passive aggressiveness, <laughs> and like, oh, oh really? That's the first I heard of that, you know what I mean? Right. What are your thoughts on some of those type of family dynamics? It's a, it's a touchy topic and it's, um, you know, it's not black or white. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a cop-out that we say addiction is a bio, psycho, social, spiritual <laughs> <laughs> disease, genetic, you know. What is it? And, and sure. um, I think it's yes to all the above mm -hmm. and no to all the above. And, right? But see, that's the thing though, the person with the addiction um, then becomes the scapegoat um, mm -hmm. solely for all the family problems. And not to say that the addiction that they had developed doesn't complicate things more and add more to it, of course, and, and an issue and problems in and of itself. But uh, that's, yeah, when sometimes the people do enter recovery and then come back home, um, you know, th sometimes that can make the rest of the family um, uncomfortable, right. could it not? Absolutely. And uh, have to address maybe some of those other issues there. I know of mm -hmm. cases where people get in recovery and, and now they're learning to own their feelings and to communicate and express that. Well, the rest of the family, like, whoa, mm -hmm. it's a little bit too much, you know, because they never did that before. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, that makes them uncomfortable. But f sometimes I've seen people who, the parents who don't have any addictions, uh, that doesn't mean there aren't other things that people do. That's the human condition that you talked about again earlier, of um, even just trying to be perfect, mm -hmm. perfectionism, you know, mm -hmm. um, workaholic, mm -hmm. you know. And so even if you don't have addictions involved, I've worked with a lot of kids who came from family systems like that and the pressure that they're under, you know, to be perfect mm -hmm. and to always live up to those high expectations was too much for them to deal with mm -hmm. and ended up going down the wrong path in their life. Well, where's the freedom in that either? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's like, well, yeah, I think whether through families or society as a whole, the person with the addictions becomes, um, you know, the scapegoat or, mm -hmm. or the, the person with the problem. We believe it's a family illness and the illness is very much the same. The progression is very much the same that the family members end up experiencing loss of control. And on 
that flip side, yeah, and um, for the compassion piece f toward the families. Right. Exactly. Um, sometimes families, again, they try their best and, and in general. Yeah, you know, parents are human beings like anybody else and mm -hmm. they make mistakes and, and maybe they've come from unresolved pain and trauma in their life too. Right. And so I, I, you know, every, anything that we, we talk about, it's not meant to necessarily be pointing fingers on either end or condemning on either side. It's just to bridge the gap and, and just to challenge and to kind of bring awareness to all the various dynamics. From the addictive person's perspective, the, mm -hmm. uh, I think it might be easier for them to see the harm that they've done and, and have some empathy for the family and um, are probably willing to be empathetic, sympathetic. Um, uh, quite often they want to fix things pretty quickly. Treatment centers and self-help programs sort of uh, encourage that and, and um, it seems to be a strong component of recovery. It's, it's a little more difficult, if I can turn it around, than for the family members um, than are asked to look at themselves. Not, not at the addicted person, but, mm. but at themselves and mm. their own dysfunction and sure. their own problems and their own issues and their own morality and, mm -hmm. and, and fix their part. Just in general to have a little bit of understanding too from the person who entered recovery and they're transitioning back into the home, back into the family, back into their community because you know, treatment it was the safe, safe spot. Yeah. And so coming out now is a whole new scary movie again. It is, it is. Uh, the addicted person is, is stressed and doing new things. The family member is going to be stressed and doing new things. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's, it's quite painful to not enable, to mm -hmm. not give, to not, mm -hmm. it feels like, oh God, I can't not care. Sure. And, uh, um, some of the language is about detaching. We detach and separate because we don't want to be so enmeshed in each other's lives and trying to control mm -hmm. and stop the controlling behavior. And uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's such a, a correlation. Um, the addicted person goes through the phases of addiction and, and you know, the middle, late stages continues to have this thinking something's going to be different. It's not going to be the same. So I can do the same thing and it will be different this time. And the family member does the same things over and over, mm -hmm. thinking it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. And, and the, so the, the behaviors are real similar. Mm -hmm. It's just one is using and one is not, but sure. the behaviors are so repetitive. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work last time and it's not going to work this time. Sure. Just as, as the, the um, user has to find out. Right, right. You know, I think there does need to be a, a component of, of fellowship, of mm -hmm. connectedness, of support. Mm -hmm. um, I think a anything where you meet and, and talk with like-minded people mm -hmm. and share your experience with uh, seems to work the best. And, yeah. Everybody yeah. needs somebody. Nobody yeah, can do it I alone. I think so. And, yeah. That's pretty science-based. Sure. I want to thank you, Gary, for coming on the show and uh, breaking down some of the dynamics of addiction and how that evolves in a person's life before they even know it. And it's not an individual problem, it's a community problem and it affects everyone and it can strike anyone as well, this illness. And, uh, but with recovery, uh, everybody also benefits. And recovery is possible, but everyone has to look at their part of it too mm -hmm. to make recovery um, come full circle and be sustainable. So that would include the family or even in the community, the culture of using that's promoted, especially in Wisconsin, or in the case of prescription drugs, um, over um, uh, prescribing people or people too quick to diagnose people or the lack of diagnosis sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's other components in play and that could be a whole nother show where we can go into more detail with that but we wanted to give you a, a good um, intro on it at least today and uh, again this is Gary Holden and um, we thank you again for coming on. Thanks Dwee. Appreciate My pleasure. It. Yeah and so uh, tune in with us again next time. Thanks.